Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining the webinar today. I'm Kate Kramer. I'm a policy analyst with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's Office for Older Americans. And my work is focused on the areas of age-friendly banking, financial technology, elder financial exploitation, and protecting people who are living in assisted living communities and nursing homes from financial abuse. And today I'm very excited to announce the release of two brand new guides for family and friends of people who are living in long-term care communities. And I'll also be highlighting a third resource, which is our newly updated guide for long-term care community staff on preventing and responding to elder financial abuse. As Robin mentioned throughout the webinar, please type any questions or comments that you have into the chat box. And if you have any personal or professional experiences that you'd like to share, we'd love to hear those as well. So feel free to enter those in and we'll have Q&A at the end where we'll answer as many of your questions as possible. Before we dive in, I just have a quick disclaimer and I'll share a little bit about my agency as well. This presentation is being made by a CFPB representative on behalf of the Bureau. It doesn't constitute legal interpretation, guidance, or advice of the CFPB. Any opinions or views stated by me are my own and may not represent the Bureau's views. So with that out of the way, just want to mention a bit about CFPB in case you're not too familiar. So our mission is to help consumer finance markets work by making rules more effective, by consistently and fairly enforcing those rules, and by empowering consumers to have more control over their economic lives. Our Office for Older Americans is part of the Consumer Education and External Affairs Division within CFPB. Our work focuses on educating consumers and intermediaries and working to help protect older consumers from financial harm and help people make sound financial decisions that fit their unique situations. Many of our resources are targeted towards people age 62 and older, as well as financial caregivers and professionals who interact with older adults. Several of our resources are focused on helping older adults, their families and caregivers and professionals who serve them to prevent elder financial exploitation. Now I'd like to talk just briefly about elder financial abuse before I introduce you to our brand new guides for family and friends of people living in long-term care communities. So first, what is elder financial abuse? To get us all on the same page, I just wanted to share this general definition. This is kind of commonly understood by aging stakeholders, and it defines elder financial abuse as a fraudulent or improper action by an individual that uses the resources of an older person for that other individual's personal benefit or gain. And the action taken by that other individual would also result in depriving the older adult of the rightful use of their own assets or resources for their own benefit. Now, the age at which someone is considered an older adult, as well as any related definitions, are going to vary among states, as well as within state civil and criminal laws. Financial abuse can take quite a few different forms. For example, someone with a legal obligation to handle an older adult's finances could fail to use those funds for necessities like food, clothing, shelter, or healthcare, and therefore put that older adult at risk of harm. People with legal obligations to handle finances might include fiduciaries such as agents under power of attorney, trustees, guardians or conservators, Social Security representative payees, or Department of Veterans Affairs fiduciaries. And if family or other individuals step in to help manage someone's finances, some of those individuals might try to take money or assets for themselves, which could seriously impact the older adult's financial well being and could also result in an inability to pay their nursing home or assisted living community bill. at all to manage the older adult's money. So someone could take possession of or control that older adult's property by pressuring or misleading or lying to them, might try to gain trust by promising care or other support if they provide access to a bank account, or they might use other control tactics. I wanna share a couple of facts and studies that help to show the scope and impact of elder financial abuse. And unfortunately, financial abuse is a common form of abuse. 
A 2017 review of U.S. studies found that about 5.6% of older individuals living in the broader community had experienced fraud or scams. And studies suggest that older adults who are living in long-term care communities might experience abuse at even higher rates than those who live in the broader community. So about 7% of elder abuse allegations reported by nursing homes in fiscal year 2015 involved either financial abuse or misappropriation of resident property. And a 2019 review of studies from around the world estimated that 13.8% of individuals living in nursing homes, assisted living communities, or similar settings experience financial abuse. Additionally, studies find that people who experience cognitive impairment are at greater risk of experiencing financial crimes. Many of us might experience mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease or dementia at some point in our lives, but it's very important not to assume or to expect cognitive impairment when interacting with older adults. We know many people who live into their 70s, 80s, 90s, and beyond do not experience cognitive impairment and continue to manage their own well being and financial affairs for many, many years. And elder financial abuse may also affect some racial groups disproportionately. In one study, they found that 23%, so a huge percentage, of older African American adults reported experiencing financial exploitation, compared with 8.4% of other older adults. And another study found that 16.7% of older Latino adults self reported experiencing financial exploitation within the previous year. So given all of this, what can we do to help protect our loved ones who live in long-term care communities from elder financial abuse? Well, our Office for Older Americans created the guide that you can see here to help people recognize the red flags of financial abuse and find out who they can contact for help in specific situations. There's also an accompanying handout on reporting elder financial abuse and that explains where and how to file reports and find resources. The guide is designed for family or friends of someone who's living in a long-term care community, but professionals of all types could also read this guide to learn about preventing financial exploitation in long-term care settings. And we do have a separate guide specifically for administrators and staff of long-term care communities, which I'll talk about a bit later in today's presentation. So first, let's take a closer look at the type of information in this guide. The guide uses brief scenarios about a fictional person named Alma to illustrate key concepts. These scenarios provide different real life examples of financial abuse that you might encounter with your friends, family members, or other community members. This is an example of one of these scenarios. The guide will walk you through four key steps to help protect older adults living in long term care communities from financial abuse. And those key steps you see here are prevent. Meaning, educate yourself, your loved ones and your community. Recognize spotting those warning signs and taking action. Record documenting what you observe and report telling the appropriate authorities so that they can step in to investigate and help. And the guide is designed to help you be ready to intervene and to help someone who's in need. So he said, step one, that's prevent, preventing financial abuse from ever occurring, or it may be taking steps to prevent an existing situation from continuing or growing worse over time. The solution of a problem can help to prevent future financial losses. So steps that can prevent further harm include early recognition, documentation, and reporting. Today, I just wanna highlight one part of the prevent section, which focuses on using technology. Technology can be used in a lot of different ways to help you stay connected with your loved ones, even if you can't visit with them in person. So for example, people who have family or friends who live far away, or maybe who can't visit due to social distancing concerns, could chat with them via text messaging or video call on a mobile device or computer. We see people who can't travel to a wedding or another family gathering who are able to share a live stream of the event and join in from afar. And you can also keep in touch and share photos, videos, or information with one another using social media. 
And you can use ask your loved ones nursing home or assisted living community if they can host the meetings by phone or video call to help you participate in meetings with the facility when in person meetings aren't feasible. The team members may also be able to help set up a video call, phone call, or internet access for your loved one to use. Using those digital tools to visit with relatives and other loved ones can expose elder financial abuse because maintaining those strong connections with friends and family gives us more people to talk to about any problems that we're having. And if a friend or family member notices something that seems suspicious, they could share those concerns with a designated team member or with the appropriate authorities. And as technology advances, new online and mobile services might be useful to help people manage their finances. For example, your loved one might be able to set up automatic alerts for their bank or credit union account so that they receive a notification whenever a transaction occurs or whenever the account drops below a certain balance. Financial institutions now typically offer services like automatic bill pay or direct deposit for checks. And some mobile apps can even remind your loved one or a financial caregiver when to pay bills or to take other financial actions. Your loved one's bank or credit union can share more detailed information about the online and mobile options that are available to them. Step two is recognize. And again, it's important to recognize and record any potential indicators of financial exploitation that you observe and that includes when your loved one is interacting with other friends, family members, or other visitors. The guide has a great deal of information about different warning signs that might indicate financial abuse. And listed on this slide are the six main categories of warning signs. Within the guide, each category will list several specific red flags that you can watch out for. The guide also has detailed information about fraud and scams that target older individuals including warning signs that scammers are targeting your loved one. And if you do believe that your loved one is the target of a phone or mail or online scam, consider talking to them about your concern or offering to help them go through and review and discard some of those scam communications. Scammers are so sophisticated, sometimes it's really difficult to tell, so an extra set of eyes can be helpful to root out those that are scam communications from those that are not. And to avoid identity theft, you can also help your loved one add security features or safety features like antivirus software, pop-up blockers, or password protection to any devices that they're using. CFPB has lots of free educational resources that you can use to teach your family members, your friends, or other people in your community about these warning signs, as well as how to avoid identity theft and scams. Free resources might also be available from your state attorney general's office or local senior centers, your local long term care ombudsman and other national organizations and federal agencies. There are a ton of these free trainings and resources out there, so I encourage you to take advantage of those that you can find. Step 3 is record, so it's important to keep those clear and accurate records of any red flags or suspicious activities that you observe. Let's talk now about some best practices for recording signs of suspected financial abuse. Number one is to get the accurate information. So talk with your loved one separately from the person you suspect might be doing them harm. And your loved one might be hesitant to acknowledge that perpetrator's actions, maybe they feel guilt or they fear retaliation, or they may just have a lot of sympathy or love for the perpetrator. And in particular, if your loved one has rescued maybe an adult child or another person from trouble repeatedly. And additionally, people who come from historically marginalized groups like people of color, recent immigrants or LGBTQ individuals may not feel comfortable reporting abuse because they've experienced a history of discrimination by traditional institutions. But with support from a trusted advocate, sometimes someone who at first doesn't want to acknowledge financial abuse might later be open to talking about the experience. And pay attention also to emotions and behavior that you see during your conversation. It could be helpful to write down your notes right away after you speak so you can keep an accurate record. And write down any warning signs you observe. Try to include the dates, times, locations, and details of any incidents, the names of any other people who might have observed it, 
and any proof like photographs or other um, financial records, any proof of what you observed. You can give this information to the authorities when you file a report. You could also keep a record of all communications like phone calls, meetings, letters, and emails that you're having maybe with facility staff or other individuals about the situation and list the names and contact information for anyone that you speak to about your concerns. It's a good idea to talk to staff members or volunteers who might have observed something and be sure that they're also documenting the incidents in their records. The final step is to report the suspected elder financial abuse to the appropriate authorities. Laws and reporting requirements are going to differ from state to state, so it's important to learn what is required in your state. And you should follow the state and federal law when you're reporting suspected elder abuse to the local authorities. If you suspect financial abuse, contact Adult Protective Services and law enforcement first to file a report. You can also ask whether they know of other agencies in your area where you can get help. A lot of times they're very well connected with other resources in the community and they may be able to find someone who can help with your unique situation. Then you can also contact the long term care ombudsman and ask how they can help to advocate for your loved one. The guide also has a list of many other places where you can report suspected financial abuse or get help for specific situations. Your report should generally include information that helps explain the situation. So the who, what, where, when, and how. Be as thorough as you can, but remember, you're just reporting your own observations. You're not investigating a crime. You're not proving a case. So think of your role as just sharing your observations in order to enable an investigator to then step in and see what can be done. And we'll talk more about reporting in just a couple of minutes because I want to also share some highlights of our new bifold guide on reporting with you. As I mentioned, the guide provides information about who to contact for help with specific situations like the ones that are listed on this slide. It's also important to understand your state's civil laws. So in some states, there are remedies beyond local adult protective services or law enforcement intervention. And these states may have laws to help survivors of financial abuse and their attorneys to bring cases in civil court and recover some of those stolen assets. And some states also have processes to freeze remaining assets or make it impossible for property transfers to proceed. In some states, banks and credit unions can delay a disbursement of funds or they can place a hold on a transaction if they suspect that elder financial abuse is occurring. Additionally, you might be able to work with a legal services attorney, which is a free attorney typically, or a private attorney that you pay yourself to file a case in civil court and you can request a restraining order or an order of protection and that could prevent the perpetrator from contacting your loved one. This type of intervention can really help to separate that perpetrator from your loved one and prevent further harm. And local civil legal services programs, and you may hear them called legal aid, they may be able to represent your loved one or again, you may need to hire a private attorney but it's a good idea to reach out first to legal services to see if you do qualify for their help because a lot of times they have specific domestic violence programs or elder financial abuse programs where they can be helpful with financial abuse cases. And if you'd like to get a copy of the new guide, you can get it for free by downloading it on our website or you can order for free a single printed copy for yourself or you can bulk order print copies for free as well. And you can keep a copy of the guide for yourself or share it with people you know who live in nursing homes or assisted living communities or people who have loved ones in those communities. So I hope the guide is helpful to you and please feel free to order that if you're interested. So now let's take a look at our new bifold guide on reporting elder financial abuse. Like I said, this is just a smaller handout focused on reporting. And as we said earlier, Family members, friends, and other concerned community members are really in a unique position to help protect their loved ones from financial abuse. So if you suspect financial abuse, you should report those suspicions to the appropriate authorities. This bifold is a quick reference guide, so it explains where and how to report elder financial abuse. Here's an excerpt from the guide. You can see two bullets here, which were pulled from the where should I report section. 
And the guide answers the following questions to help guide people in the right direction so that they can take steps to help resolve the situation. It answers questions like, what is financial abuse? Where should I report financial abuse? What information do I need to file a report? What other types of help are available to me? What legal options might we have? What can I do about problems with an assisted living or nursing home team member or problems with financial caregivers or problems with scammers? And where can I find more information? And here's a screenshot showing the what information do I need to file a report section. This section encourages people to include as much key information as possible in their report but you should still file a report even if you don't feel you have all of the details in order to enable those authorities to investigate the situation. Then the investigators might be appropriate in order to help the person who's experiencing financial abuse. So please feel free to visit our website to download this handout, or again, you can order the print version either for your own reference or to hand out in your community. There is one final resource in our series of preventing elder financial abuse guides. This is a newly updated guide to help nursing home and assisted living community administrators and team members to prevent and address financial abuse of their residents. The guide is designed to help staff identify warning signs and develop policies, procedures and training for their teams to prevent elder financial abuse. We released the original version of this guide back in 2014, and just in October, we released a newly updated version of this guide where we reorganized the information and added some new information, including new real life scenarios, new information about using technology and other topics. The guide is for, again, the staff, as well as business office personnel, social services personnel, any team members at the community that might be involved in the move in process and other folks. And much of the information in this guide could be useful in other residential settings as well for older adults or for individuals with disabilities of any age. And it's printed as a spiral bound notebook, so we wanted to make it a little easier to keep it open on specific pages of interest so that staff can easily refer back to it as they're reviewing their policies and their procedures related to elder financial abuse. So I wanna share just a few highlights from this guide for staff. So let's start with its emphasis on establishing a team approach to financial security. The guide recommends that long-term care communities assemble a team that will form that front line on financial abuse. And the team should implement a system so that they can conduct early and effective responses to suspected financial abuse through regular meetings, case review, and other types of coordinated action. An effective team is going to promote the safety of all residents as well as the financial security of the nursing home or assisted living community itself. Another key component of the guide for staff is that it encourages nursing homes and assisted living communities to develop those policies and practices to prevent elder financial abuse. This includes helping new residents, families, and caregivers to understand the abuse prevention policies at move-in and to have policies about working together with financial caregivers so that the community and the caregivers can work together to serve the resident. The guide also recommends monitoring residents' payments to the nursing home or assisted living community and intervening quickly to look for signs of financial abuse if bills are not being paid. It's important for long-term care communities to establish hiring policies and training for staff and volunteers that emphasize abuse prevention. The guide has a list of warning signs of elder financial abuse, as well as information on hosting trainings on abuse and scam prevention for residents and community members, and information on collaborating with Adult Protective Services, law enforcement, the long-term care ombudsman, and other key partners to fight elder financial abuse. The Guide for Long-Term Care Staff also has information about how staff can report suspected abuse to the appropriate authorities including information on how definitions of financial abuse or exploitation and reporting requirements might vary in different states. And nearly all states do require healthcare providers to report suspected abuse, neglect, or exploitation to Adult Protective Services or another public authority. 
And almost all states have provisions that provide immunity for good faith reporting of suspected elder financial abuse. So that means that you wouldn't be held liable if it turns out that the activity that you observed was not financial abuse, as long as you made the report in good faith or a similar standard that would be spelled out in your state laws. So please visit our website to download the guide for long-term care staff or order those free print copies. Now I want to touch briefly on a few more resources from CFPB that might be helpful to you. This is a guide that we recently updated just a couple of months ago, and CFPB and the SEC worked together to create this consumer advisory about planning for diminished capacity and illness. In our update, we added tips for adding a trusted contact person to your financial accounts, who your financial institution can contact in case of emergency, and some other information as well. The guide helps you to prepare for your financial future. I really like this guide because I like to think about it as imagining a future you and taking steps that you can take today to protect your future self. And guardianship could be lengthy, expensive, and it's a public process that can be really difficult for yourself as well as for family members and friends. So there are other options like powers of attorney or trust that you could put in place ahead of time to reduce that future strain on yourself and your family. This guide helps people think through their options and take those steps to plan for the future. Our Managing Someone Else's Money guides introduce key concepts to financial caregivers. We have guides for agents under a power of attorney, guardians and conservators, trustees, as well as Social Security and Department of Veterans Affairs representatives. Many of us may either be serving as a financial caregiver in a formal way, like one of these roles, or perhaps in an informal way for a loved one, or we might have a financial caregiver who is helping us out. These guides can help to answer questions about someone's rights, responsibilities, and options as a financial caregiver. The Managing Someone Else's Money Guides walk caregivers through their duties, explain those key terms and key concepts, and also provide resources where they can get help with different situations. And we also have information if you're interested to help you co-brand the guides with your organization's name. So you're welcome to co-brand these guides and share them in your community. These are great guides to order in bulk, and you can hand them out to people who have questions about caregiving or distribute them at community events. And you can order or download these guides for free in English or Spanish. Those of us who are financial caregivers can use the information in these guides to help us make good financial decisions on behalf of our loved one. We have a lot of new resources for you today, and I'm excited to share this new resource called Considering a Financial Caregiver Know Your Options. We just released it in November, and it's the latest piece added to our Managing Someone Else's Money series. This resource is designed for people who are early on in the caregiving process. So maybe you're just starting to notice that you or a loved one might need help with managing your finances, or maybe you're planning ahead for your own financial future and you wanna put some things in place. And knowing their options is going to help people choose what works best for their unique situation. So this is a shorter resource um, to the point, and it covers informal caregiving options like a convenience account for your bank or credit union account, or adding a trusted contact person to your account. It also covers formal caregiving options like power of attorney, guardian, trustee, or government fiduciaries. And finally, it has a list of questions to help you consider who is the best person to choose as your financial caregiver for each of these roles. We hope you'll check it out and you can order copies and you can find it along with our other managing someone else's money materials at consumerfinance.gov slash msem. Next is our Money Smart for Older Adults curriculum. This is a scam awareness program that we developed together with the FDIC. And there are multiple components to this. There is an instructor guide and a PowerPoint that you can use to deliver presentations to groups. And there's also a resource guide that can be handed out to groups or individuals. It's really a plug and play program. The fully scripted instructor guide will enable you to present this content really easily in your community. You definitely don't have to be an elder fraud expert because we provide you 
with the script, the PowerPoint, and all the tools you need to get this important information out to your community. Or if you don't want to give a presentation, you can simply order copies of the resource guide, which you can either provide as a supplement to your presentation, or you could just order it to read and share with others as a standalone resource. The resource guide is in 14 point font also to make it a little more accessible and readable. And it has information and activities to help learn the scam prevention material, as well as a glossary of key terms and resources on managing money and reporting financial exploitation. You can order all of these free materials in English or Spanish, and you can get our resources again for free in bulk from our website. We also recently updated Money Smart for Older Adults with some new information on romance scams because we've seen that particular type of scam really growing in recent years and in particular during the pandemic. So please check it out to see that update, even if you've seen the Money Smart curriculum before. Now, our popular fraud prevention series helps you to share important information about avoiding common scams. And last fall, so a couple months back, we released new materials. Those included bookmarks, posters, and table tents, all of which you can order for free. And many of these have word games or crossword puzzles or other interactive activities that help people engage with and learn the concepts of fraud prevention. These are great. We can order them in English or Spanish and use them for events, gatherings, or group meals. You can hand them out at local community centers or faith-based organizations, or download the electronic versions of these handouts to share by email or on a website. Our Ask CFPB resource is an online database that has answers to a ton of financial questions. So if you have a question about a financial product or service, you might be able to find an answer here. And the information that's in Ask CFPB can help people make more informed financial choices and better manage their money. We're adding to this all the time. So if there's a new topic, a new financial service or product that you're confused about or want more information about, it may have been added already to here. The final resources I wanna share with you today are our resources related to the pandemic. We have a central hub at consumerfinance.gov slash coronavirus, where we have resources to help people protect and manage their finances. These resources are available in English as well as multiple other languages, as you can see here. We also have a special COVID-19 housing hub where we provide people with mortgage and housing assistance during the pandemic. We've recently released a new rental assistance finder tool and that's specifically for renters who need help. The tool lets you look up what rental assistance is available to you by state and county, and then it refers you to the correct resources to apply for that assistance. So if you need help paying your rent or your utility bills, or you're struggling with other financial impacts of the pandemic, you can find all of those resources on our coronavirus page. These sites are getting updated all the time as the situation changes, so it's important to check back for updates. You can also join our Office for Older Americans mailing list, and we'll send you occasional updates about new resources, new blog posts, webinars like the one you're watching today, and other updates. So please, if you're interested, go to our website and sign up for that mailing list. Thanks so much for your time and attention today. I really appreciate you joining us to learn about our new guides. And if you have any questions, please go ahead and type them into the chat box, and we have plenty of time to answer them. And this webinar will also be recorded and posted to our Older Americans webinar archive, so you could rewatch or share with colleagues, friends, or family in the future. It usually comes up in a couple of weeks after the webinar. Again, thank you so much. Please enter your questions into the chat box and we will get to them. Hi, Debbie. Yeah, that is a huge issue that 
I agree. It's very difficult to report often when those smaller items are stolen or it may be difficult for the resident to know who was there or what happened to them to their belongings. Um, I'm not aware of any resources specifically for the theft of items from the room or the residence. But I certainly think there's a lot of education that can be done in terms of um, the actual community staff or other folks who are coming in and out, volunteers, even cleaning staff, to be aware of see something, say something, and to recognize and report if they you know, notice things that are going missing from a resident's room or they hear a resident complaining about something being stolen. It's really important, I think, for communities to really create that culture of recognize and report so that people don't feel comfortable as if they can get away with something like that. And it's a really challenging situation. And I know it happens to a lot of residents. Okay, I'm sorry, I had asked a question and my microphone was down. Um, this is, uh, you have a question from IK. It says, what do elderly people who have no relatives and no family around um, as they get older and fall? Yeah, that's really challenging as well. I think in particular, it impacts a lot of LGBTQ individuals and other folks who are already facing a lot of extra barriers. And then the isolation compounds the challenges that they have in terms of recognizing and reporting financial abuse and other types of situations. I think you mentioned falling. Um, but for the folks who really don't have family around, that's a big part of why we're recommending some of those video calls, text messaging, social media communications, so that people who maybe don't have someone nearby, but perhaps they do have a friend or a family member who lives far away, at least you can maintain those connections in a way that gives that person someone to talk to you about any problems that they're having or things that they're observing and gives them a safe person to share their concerns with. So then that friend or family member can turn around and advocate for them, maybe connect them with the long-term care ombudsman to advocate for them in their facility or connect them with the right resources in their community. But it's definitely a challenge. Isolation is so difficult and has such significant mental health impacts and physical health impacts. And it's only grown during the pandemic. We've heard so many stories from long-term care communities where folks are severely isolated due to the pandemic. You had a comment from Wes regarding the um, Deb's question, and he was stating that isn't the facility required to list an inventory of the personal items upon admission to the facility? That's a great question. I'm actually not aware. It may depend on state law, but that's something that I'll certainly look into. If that is required, I'm not sure how often they're required to update it as residents may gain new possessions or you know, get rid of some of their existing possessions. So it'd be interesting to learn that as well. A lot of questions regarding the slides. Everyone wants to see, make sure that the slides will be available to them. I think Robin, we have everyone's email addresses because everyone registered. So I think we are able to send out the slides, but please correct me if I'm wrong. Either way, we will be also posting a recording of this webinar to our OA webinar archive. So they'll be available there in a video form. But Robin, if we can email it out, I'm happy to do that. Okay, thank you. I'm trying to see if there are any more questions coming in for you. Uh, it looks like they're having a, a pretty lively conversation, so um, they're giving answers back and forth to one another, which is really great. Yeah, it looks like folks are saying that the facility should list an inventory of items, um, but it looks like it may depend from state to state. It looks like in California, they are required to create an inventory, but I'm not sure how often they're required to update it. And someone asked, where do we sign up for alerts or more WebEx events? You can go to our website, which is listed here, consumerfinance.gov slash older Americans, 
and there's a right-hand sidebar that you can click on and enter your email address, and that way you'll be added to our mailing list. And we'll send you alerts when we have more webinars or new resources or whatever it is we're emailing you about. And it looks like someone asked for a link for the Planning for Diminished Capacity Bulletin. I can find that and pop it in the chat real quick. Here's the link to the web page for the Diminished Capacity Bulletin, and you can also order it online um, from Pueblo. All right, well, I'm not seeing any new questions, so thank you all so much for attending. We really appreciate you coming, and I hope that you'll find at least one or two of our resources helpful in your work or in your personal life. Okay, so um, Caitlin, are we closing the event at this time? I think so. If anyone has other questions, you can feel free to email the email address there, and we're happy to respond to you at any time if something comes up in the middle of the night that you wish you had asked. Okay, with that, everyone, I want to say thank you so very much for joining the webinar. We hope that uh, the information has been helpful. And as Caitlin said, if you have any other questions, please use the email address that's noted here on the slide to send those questions to Caitlin's office and they will definitely take care of you. With that, thank you all so very much. You have a wonderful rest of your week and happy holidays, everyone. Thank you, Robin. Thanks, everyone.